even though I'm quite happy to go to bed at 10 o'clock with a cup of tea um, and a book or a film, I still from time to time think, oh, that'd be quite fun just to, you know, once in a while do that, have a big blowout and just enjoy enjoy the excesses and, and the fun of it. Uh, but in reality, maybe if I actually did do that, it would probably get to midnight and I would be kind of... God, it's really loud in here. What? <laughs> the thought of it is very, it's often very attractive, but actually doing it less so. Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Will Warren is the co-host of Track by Track, a podcast that reviews, track by track, funnily enough, brilliant pop albums from the past. And we're talking unashamedly pop. Think Girls Aloud, Pet Shop Boys, and Kylie Minogue. But long before he was reviewing albums online, he was drinking a ridiculous amount of alcohol at Flamingo's, a bar in Bristol, England, that billed itself as the Southwest Gay Super Club. We caught up to talk Alcopops, pre-drinks at your friend's house, and all-you-can-drink alcohol for £20. You would turn if I was in my flat. You could turn Grinder on, and it would bring up everyone that was on Grinder in the club, <gasps> just over the road and around the corner a little bit. And so, did you use that as a way of like, shall I go out tonight? <sighs> no, normally me and my friends would get it out, and then we would just um, just go through and think and look for anyone that we recognised, um, and not have a good laugh, but just have a good conversation about the people that we would see on there. Maybe there was some past experience or story to tell. That was always good fun. (laughs) Just like bingo or something. I think also the the flats that I lived in, they were very renowned for having a lot of uh, gay men living in it. I think probably because it was city centre, just around the corner from the old market, gay village, So if you turned it on, there was normally a lot of people very close to you, um, either living there or visiting. And so did you ever use that as a pickup line? (laughs) I live around the corner. Uh, Probably. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember. (laughs) Convenient that, right? (laughs) It's like questioning an MP. (laughs) Not to the best of my recollection. (laughs) Oh, but that's weird. So, like, living in a building um, with a bunch of other homosexuals, um, was there, like, a hooking up thing going on? And then shame when you saw them in the lift? Uh, There wasn't something I ever did, because you don't, you would never do it on your doorstep. I mean, because you don't I mean, I would. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Um... I just have in mind this like farce where people are running from in one door and out the out the other, kind of like some, <laughs> some carry on film. Uh, but no, that was never something That's that I great though. Like you know, if you ever like wanted a late night hookup, but you're like, oh, it's raining, I don't want to go out. And then if they're like in the same building, you don't even have to like put shoes on. I was I was never I I'd always if if I, if we were out having a few drinks, I'd always in I'd always be out for a for a kiss and whatnot but i would i never used to really um put myself about hugely in, in <laughs> sense. is that a known phrase that i've just never heard put myself about oh yeah <laughs> right. yeah if you see someone and you're like oh she puts herself out about, she puts herself about a bit it's like yeah you know where she, you know what she's up to yeah she's so like slutting it up yeah Ah. Oh. All right, I'm going to start using that. Start slipping it in. <laughs> slipping it in. Oops. Right. Flamingos. Tell me about the time of your life when you first started going there. 
It was it was a really fun time. It was it was kind of it was uh, sort of two thousand and eight, um, and the kind of few years um, that followed that. I'd graduated from uni, moved to London, got a job in TV, paying absolutely nothing, but had such a great time just soaking up city life after growing up in a village in Devon, and I and I loved it. But I got to a point where I don't think it was very good for me, and I was very. I had a very unhealthy lifestyle. I wasn't enjoying the work I was doing. Um, and I knew friends and family in Bristol. So um, it was a great place to go to, to do for a new chapter. Mm-hmm. And that was then sort of late 2008, early 2009, when I moved, when I left London and moved to Bristol. And, you know, quickly kind of got dived into kind of what Bristol had to offer as a city uh, made loads of new friends um, and some people I already knew, um, and there's a quite and at the time there was quite a good um, gay scene there with quite a bit of choice and variety. And I know that's not the case so much now as with a you know that's why we're here, aren't we? We were talking about things that are no longer with us, mm. but I think it's changed a lot. But back then there were you know there were a couple of big areas in Bristol that had a kind of gay village feel to them, um, you know, in a city which isn't huge by any standard, uh, but it was definitely, uh, it was a great move at the time. And yeah, like I said, I had a good time, made lots of friends. Um, I got a bit fitter and a bit healthier as well. I started doing something that I enjoyed more. Um, and ultimately I met my partner who I'm now with of nearly 10 years. So it kind of, it just all clicked there. 10 years, wow. Almost <laughs> April. April, it'll be 10 years. Oy vey. Um, so <laughs> what was that? Like, so you were about like 28, 29 when you moved? So I would have been, yeah, 28. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 28 when I moved. So what's that like starting again? Uh, it didn't, I think it didn't really, it didn't necessarily feel like I was starting again. It just felt like the next stage, the next chapter. And... I think because I already had kind of established friendships and connections in the city and I'd visited it quite a bit as well. Um, it just felt very comfortable. If mm-hmm. it, it's, it's like when you do something and it feels, it just feels like the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely, it's always a big gamble when you kind of up roots and relocate to a different city, but I definitely, and I was apprehensive, but I definitely felt once I'd moved, I'd done the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so settling in, like making new connections, like reconnecting with people that you already knew, you started going out on the scene. Were there friends to go out with or were you going out on your own? It was always a big, it was always a big group. It always felt like an, a, a, an event. There was never, you, you, I was never short of somebody to go out with. And I very quickly had a really good group of sort of three, four or five people and depending on the week and what was happening and the night, other people would join as well. And I think that's what really, I think that's what we, uh, why I really look back on it fondly is because it was a really great group of people. And there, did, there wasn't often too much drama. Um, and we'd often take joy and drama happening around us, not necessarily to us, as is, as is the way probably still to some to some um to some respect um but yeah so there was you and and you go out more you get to know other people as well and so you would always see lots of familiar faces out and bristol isn't a big city either so you do get to know people who friends of friends and you notice people and recognize oh that's so and so and like you give them nicknames don't you as well and there was always oh <laughs> tell a, me tell me who who did you give nicknames to well there was always there was always a guy that wandered around with um a backpack on his back and we always used to joke that he had a, he had a he had a head in the backpack and he just didn't want to let go of it. It was just really, you know, just the sort of jokes that only friends would find funny within friends. And, you know, I love all of that. And for me, that's when friendships are at their, you know, their most, where the chemistry is at its best is when you have your in jokes, it's easy, it's fun. And you just get, the, yeah, yeah. you just get each other. 
So, but, but like that's that's the example. There's nothing more offensive than guy with a head in his bag. <laughs> nothing through nothing that I would share. Um, <laughs> Ooh, oh, I have to wait till later then when you've warmed we'll up a bit. <laughs> um so group of people like i'm you know as you may be able to tell a very socially awkward person so groups of people terrify me what um what is the ceremony of going out is it going around to someone's place and then going out oh it's this was like this is time when like pre-drinks was like the the thing and it's like still a thing that happens a lot now but it, it it really felt like then that was like as much a part of the ceremony of the night out and the evening as as actually going to the to going to the pubs and bars and clubs were and i had a really great flat that was right in the cent- in the city center of bristol and it was literally just a 2 minute walk from one of the main sort of gay village areas and so it would be the tradition that everyone would come around to my flat um and one of the flats I had had a re it was on the top floor and it is amazing view looking out over the city with these huge windows down one side. And it just felt like it was so great to have people over and to host. And I honestly don't know how we survived those evenings when with the amount of alcohol that was consumed just before going out, let alone when you actually got in into the into the club. And Flamingos was notorious for binge drinking which we'll, we'll come on to uh, so is it one of those situations where you drink as much as you can at home so you don't have to pay expensive drink prices when you go out well no this is the thing once you got to flamingos they would be they would do first of all it was the first thing they did when i first got there or even this i when i visited they, they were doing this thing before i moved and it was it was drink the bar dry and it was like 20 pounds for as much as you could drink uh, unlimited and it seems crazy now because that's like really not 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 on anymore and then um so you would drink as much as you could at home in the pre-drinks and then you would go to the club and drink as much as you could to try and get your to try and get your money's worth and honestly it was carnage but again part of the fun of the of the <laughs> night they had because i think there was like laws change and there was a big focus on like binge drinking culture so they did it's different thing and it was uh 10 drinks for 20 pounds and and i I guess they probably thought they were being more responsible but then it became like a competition who could drink their 10 drinks the first (laughs) who could have the 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 10 marks on their wristband first and how often were you first i was never first but Funnily enough, the people that were first were often the people that were just literally uh, on the pavement outside well before 1 a.m. Uh, but it was like... They were still winners, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Like the record what state. <laughs> so when I, if I think about it now and what we enjoy doing like in, in our flat in London, it is having people over... You know, we, there's some food, you're making some cocktails and some drinks and then, you know, time disappears. And before you know, it, it's like 2, 3 a.m. And I think it was that feeling of that that kind of pre-drinks that was all, sometimes that was like the funnest part because it was just you and your gang making all these weird drinks and do, playing drinking games and playing the music you and love. And controlling the music. Yeah, that's what I was yes. going to say. <laughs> and there's nothing more commanding than a gay in charge of the music at the pre-drinks but but like so with your friends were they interested in what you had to play or were they all just like yeah yeah whatevs oh absolutely and you know i've i've you know i've got very particular tastes in music which we talk a lot about on track by track um and but that was the time when like girls allowed were huge uh and there was this there was a real kind of dance pop thing going on through the charts um sugar babes are at their peak as well um and everybody loved that music and it that was very much saturday night sort of party music as well and do you ever are you ever like oh guys i've heard this new song and i want no, like you need to hear it and then play it and then when no one's interested you sulk yes <laughs> there was i remember one time there was a long forgotten about act um called mini viva 
oh. and they were like uh, they were a duo and they were, had the same producers um, as Girls Aloud, so Xenomania. And I was like, you've got to listen to this song. This is going to be like the, sa- the song of the summer. <laughs> it's going to be everywhere. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, it's all right. But then it was just like, I don't think it even got into the top 100. Of Which the, song was the, that? One Touch. Oh, okay. Which yeah, was like the follow, the third single they yeah, released. Yeah. It was a bit of a last last chance saloon, I think, for them, and they were they were dropped quite soon after. Uh, but that was the one, and I was like, "This is it. This is going to be the big one." <laughs> and it was just a lukewarm reception on the on on the night. But what, then, what do actually, they know? it was <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, first time at Flamingos. I can remember I remember it really well actually because it was I was I was visiting from London um my friends and we they were like raving about kind of this place and how it was like craziness but really fun and it's like you've got to come here um and you can drink as much as you want and I was like what get out of it that's not that's not true and so we we went and it was really fun but i just remember how uh like one of my friends couldn't stand up someone else disappeared and and i'm like do i really want to come and live in here with these people it's such a Uh, weird business model how do they make money well you know ultimately they're not around anymore so (laughs) um, might tell you all you need to know it was packed every weekend and they used to do a student night as well on a Wednesday and it was same same provise, uh, proviso, but it was £10 rather than 20 <laughs> But again, they just used to pack it in and th- uh, there wasn't a night at the weekend, Friday or Saturday, when there wasn't a queue down the road um, to go in. So, so you went the first time, your friends got very, very drunk uh, you questioned whether or not you actually wanted to move to Bristol, but then you did. But then I did because Bristol's a really cool city as well. And I think it was definitely what I needed at the time. And, you know, I've made some lifelong friendships there as a result of it and a, and a, and a, and a, and a long term relationship as well. But I think it was but I think it was there was enough fun there in that night. And I saw enough of kind of what else was out there on the scene in Bristol to think this would be a really fun place to live as well as being kind of what I need um, for my life at that point. And, you know, so much so that, you know, we're, we're moving back to Bristol, me and my partner, Dom, and that's something that's going to be happening quite soon this year as well. Um, And we'll be, we'll be picking back up with quite a few people that, you know, I, we made friends with through um, the Flamingo days and, and beyond Dom and I never were never together during the flamingo times, but we would have definitely been in there at the same time, but just not known it back uh, then. Our paths didn't cross. The kind and of, uh, then when it closed, you sobered up and <laughs> uh, <laughs> realized. See, that was the other thing as well. The the drinks that they serve there. I think maybe another way how they made money was there was definitely not. You had the premium bottles of spirits, but I don't didn't always feel like you were getting a premium drink. And <laughs> there was a lot of sugar in like alcohol pops and things. So you didn't necessarily have a hangover in the morning. You had the shakes because of the, sh- the amount of sugar that you'd consumed. Um, and the number of like VKs and things you'd, you'd, you'd drunk the night before as well. But what, so it wasn't just like blanket any alcohol or is it just the kind of alcohol you were drinking it was blank you could have whatever obviously they would put the the really good stuff away on for those not on those (laughs) um but pretty much you know you can have your you can have your your lager or your spirits with a mixer or a bottle of um alco pops or whatever but the alco pops were never like what was the premium one at the time like smirnoff ice it was always like a a blue or a purple colored bottle or, or um, do you remember the orange uh, reef that was like, it was basically like drinking really, really sweet orange and pineapple juice concentrated. <laughs> um, and you couldn't taste any alcohol. And if you had more than two, you'd feel sick. 
Are Alcopop still a thing? I I don't think they're anywhere near as huge as they they were like back in the late nineties and the early noughties when it was uh, Smirnoff Ice, Bacardi Breezer. Um, what else was there? Archers, uh, Archers Aqua, Mad Dog, all sorts of things. What was that non-alcoholic one? J two O. J two O. That's still. Does that that's still, still exist? That's still a big one. J two O. Which is basically just like fruit juice, isn't it? Yeah, it's so gross. I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> They're just overly sweet, aren't they? Yeah, like if you're not drinking alcohol, it's like you can have water or you can have diabetes. Like, that's <laughs> it. There's no middle ground. No, no, not at all. Um, so what kind of size was the place? So it was... Um, it was so it was always it used to be billed as the only southwest gay super club um <laughs> that was and, his tagline yeah but it really wasn't like the size like the astoria used to be or like heaven is now if you're talking like gay super clubs it was big in terms of you know because my experience of like gay bars in the southwest are basically like little underground shoe boxes um that you kind of if you walk more than two steps too far, you've missed the entrance to it because it's so anonymous and so tiny. So this was big by those standards. And it had one main room, which was like the pop, this kind of trashy pop room, poppy, dancey room. And then there was a downstairs, there was another room, which was kind of out the back and down some stairs. And that was more of like the, the harder dance room. But even then, it wasn't really that hard dance. It was more just remixes of pop songs. Um, and then you'd have like there was a choir to sort of chill out bar area in the middle uh, and kind of the inevitable hor- horrendous toilets with just like no doors and overflowing toilets and all all sorts going on in there as well. Um, Writing so, that down for later. All sorts. <laughs> um, but so in terms of a super club, not quite. But in terms of like, yeah. If you're thinking like Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, as like the Southwest, yeah, that would have been the biggest thing. Uh, I remember they always used to call the different dance floor areas arenas, which again <laughs> make it sound the kind of this whole kind of grand thing. When you look at the building from the outside, it really didn't look very big at all, but it kind of went on out the back. I'm not sure what it is now. I think it is still some kind of uh, entertainment venue, but more of a kind of um kind of event space uh mm. place that you know does like art teas in the afternoon and then maybe is like a a performance space in the evening so it's it's very different but uh yeah that area has changed quite a lot but it was very they had a big refurbishment i remember kind of a couple of years into my time being there and it was just never as good because it was just too it gotten too shiny and they tried to make it too glossy and sparkly but at the same time hadn't probably invested enough money to make it amazing as good as it could be was that because there was new owners or i think it was probably more it had been a huge success and they were just trying to invest in for the future i'm not sure i tried to do a bit of research before we recorded today but very little inf- as with a lot of the places that you talk about on here there's very little information mm. still existing for it so i don't know about kind of the ownership and when and why they decided to do it but it just always felt like it was a bit better and a bit more fun when it was kind of the older the in its old yeah yeah and like a lot of places isn't it i think maybe and it's also your first memories of a place when it has a makeover you're less attached to it because it doesn't look and feel as much like it was when you first discovered it. So you feel less ownership on it, I think. But did they fix the toilets? The toilets were better. Um, And, you know, to be honest, I can't even remember if there was much funny business going on in the toilets because I can never remember being in Flamingos and not being very drunk. (laughs) Wasted. I think in terms of if you wanted to go to a club and um have a good time in that sense there were probably there were other places you could go to um in bristol 
Wait, wait, do you, you mean have fun in the toilets? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, or maybe not even in the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like in a sling somewhere, I get you. Um, do you, like, so I know you were um, keen to play down the term super club um, when you talked about the, the venue, but do you think we'll ever see those types of super clubs again? Or is it just their days done? I don't I don't think we will. I just think regardless of what's happened over the last year with COVID, I just think we've moved on to people uh, very people using their own space and enjoying their own spaces. Like I was saying about, you know, being able to host uh, and it just doesn't feel like it, uh, going to a super club is quite an anonymous, overpriced experience in my experience i don't know whether that's what people really want anymore um and certainly you know with you know with lgbtq plus spaces i i definitely don't think that's something that's i think we i think people want more local independent spaces but not that kind of huge chasm um where thousands of people go i don't know what I don't I don't know what there is to enjoy as much from that now. People are all about personalization now, aren't they? And doing unique experience, bespoke experiences, not an experience that thousands of other people are having the same one of at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But I kind of like it. What do you like about I it? Don't, I don't know if I'm just being a contrarian, but I kind of like that, like that an, a, anonymity. I mean, that you know, it's probably why I live in London. That like just being in a place and like n- not necessarily running into people that you know and just like, you know, all night you can go without, with just seeing new people all the time. So more people to potentially snog, obviously. Um, you and, bump into it again if you don't want to see them again. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you feel like, this isn't fun, see ya. Maybe I just want that cheers experience where you walk in and everybody shouts your <laughs> name as you walk in and you get a round, the studio audience gives you a round of applause and someone immediately gets you a drink in as well. Uh, maybe I just want to be spoilt. Yeah, well, see, I'm the kind of person that when I go to a house party, I'm always the last to leave because I feel too bad about like leaving. I feel really guilty. (laughs) (laughs) So I like that kind of club where I don't feel that kind of social pressure of like people expecting me to be a certain way. Oh, that whole kind of, well, if I leave, there's only going to be one other person. (laughs) And that's not fair on that person, on the person who's (laughs) yeah there is that as well isn't it that kind of social conscience of wanting people to be happy and looked after and supported yeah yeah which you just don't have to do in a super club you can just be like fuck this i'm off see you uh again maybe it's age just um, (laughs) i don't want to i don't want to walk half a mile from the dance floor to the toilet (laughs) Mm, just think who you could meet on the way I think we did spend a New Year's in Flamingos once. And I just, I think my overriding memory of it was, it was New Year's can never live up to the excitement in your head of what it could be like. And I remember, I think it was just so crowded and overly busy that it tipped from being enjoyable to not being as pleasant. And that's the thing, like everyone is so hell-bent on it being the best night ever that they just become kind of obnoxious and overbearing, don't they? And I would, I would, I've been that person in the past where I've wanted New Year's to be so good that I, you get really militant with, right, we're going here now, this is the plan, we can't be late for this. The best, the best nights of Flamingos were the ones where you probably weren't even intending on going out and you just finish work and you text a few people and then like at seven o'clock the plan comes together spontaneous there's no build-up there's no excitement you just it just kind of happens and then you're like wow that was a great night and whoever's about is who is whoever is about but were there any like you know being it like that that you were kind of socializing in a group and going out um uh with uh, like a range of people were there any amazing nights that you missed out on 
I like to think that those didn't happen when <laughs> I wasn't there, but um, I think there was that was definitely a feeling like before I moved, and there was a um, there was another really good night in Bristol called Wonky, which used to be on a th- oh I can't remember, but it was on a I think it was like once a month on a Friday or a Saturday. And it was more of like an indie alternative night, but not in a really alternative night. It was more like Bristol's Alphabet. Uh, Alphabet <laughs> or Bristol's answer to pop stars, um, which was yeah. great because it kind of hit that intersection of like pop music, electronic music, and indie music that I that I still love now. Uh, and they were, I remember before I moved to Bristol, but I knew I was going to do it my friends that were down there would often go there because it was only once a month. It was hard to get to be there for it. And I would often feel like because it was only a monthly thing that it was like a special thing that I would, that I was missing out on. Um, and then I moved there and we went every, every bloody month for the next two years. <laughs> but um, Novelty wore off after that, but. But that is the thing. Like, so just as uh, with New Year's Eve, you're like hell bent on it being the best night of your life. When there's a monthly night or a quarterly night or something, you would just like kind of squeeze the joy out of it sometimes, don't you? (laughs) And that's the danger sometimes of building up to be something bigger than it will be. And then it falling a bit flat because it could never live up to your expectations of what it was going to be like they were they were some really fun nights at wonky as well i think because the music was a lot different to your flamingos dance pop um and a similar sort of thing that you get in the queen shilling but that was a bit more kind of camp classics to it i think that's where you would hear you know a bit of alphabet or lady tron or um the gossip and it was that felt exciting because you just didn't hear that music out mm. very often. Mm. And, I, and I still love that feeling of when you're in a pub or in a club and a song you love comes on that you just never hear um, outside of your headphones or in your own, in your own flat. And it feels like there's such a, no, such a lovely personal connection then when you think, Oh, someone's playing that just for me. Uh, because no one else is 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 mouthing along to the words or bobbing their head because they don't know that song and it's a song you love. And but never Mini Viva. Never Mini Viva. I mean, you still hear I Left My Heart in Tokyo from time to time. <laughs> one, the one that got in the top 10, which was the first, the first one they released. And that was a bit of a, a very catchy, but you wouldn't hear any of the other ones. But, uh, not um, anymore. but how awful is it when the DJ or like, you know, the jukebox. Mm, I don't know why I said jukebox. Um, when the DJ plays a song that you love and you're like so hyped about it, and then you're like storm the dance floor, and then everyone else leaves the dance floor because <laughs> they don't know the song and they're just like, oh yeah, I don't want to dance to this. And then you're kind of just awkwardly there, like yeah, trying to get your life, but halfway through the yeah. song you have to kind of accept defeat. Oh, totally. You take it as a personal insult. <laughs> Everyone else where you are doesn't enjoy the the song that you love. Um, There's a great Bristol memory that's more recent, actually, because Dom and I still go back from time to time. And we, apart from this year just gone, we would have an annual Christmas bash with our group of Bristol friends. Uh, And so we'd go out for dinner, a late lunch, and then just basically drink our way through to the small (laughs) hours in the morning. And we would always go into this one bar on Frogmore Street and they have like a digital jukebox there. And we always put, uh, it's all coming back to me now by Celine Dion <laughs> and just bellow it at the top of our heads. And there's like a group of 10 of us doing that with the rest of the bar completely not getting, getting it. But there's, that's, but when you get to that point, um, you don't care because it's just you and your mates having a, having a great time with something that you, that's like your joke and that you love. Did you did you see the I I only saw the headline so I'm like just telling you half a story. Did you see the guy who changed his name to Celine Dion when he was drunk? Yes. I did. I sent it to one of my friends. I actually I sent it to Dan um who I do who I do track by track with. Um 
we have this thing where we just send ridiculous news headlines and say, oh, look, they printed your they printed your story. And that was the one I sent to Dan. And I was like, oh, didn't this happen to you as well once? Because often on the podcast, we get into these ridiculous uh, conversations around, oh, remember the time when you did this insert ridiculous thing that isn't true? And then we almost have to keep then improvising off the back of it just for fun. Uh, <laughs> But yes, I had did see that. Um, but how, how can you do it? Did you read it, or did you just read the headline? I just I didn't read the full article, but I just thought from reading the headline, I should have read the article to find out how do you go from how do you maintain that level of drunkness from <laughs> having that idea and then actually going through with it without having any moment of any sort of sobering moment at all to change your mind or to think better of it. But also, like, I thought it was a bit harder to change your name. Well, I think you have to you have to go somewhere, don't you? And um, you have to pay. You have to go and sign something. Yeah. To, a, to, like, the town, I don't know, to the town hall? Or is that to register the birth of a child? But, yeah, like, I that's just... the thing. Like, they won't let parents call their kids Satan, but they'll let this guy change his name to Celine Dion. <laughs> I think it was probably a little bit um, enhanced. Maybe he changed his Facebook name to Celine Dion. <laughs> That's not exactly newsworthy. Not- anyway, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'll, yeah. I'm one of those people who reads the headlines and then reports it as though it's fact. <laughs> um, so do you remember hearing about Flamingo's closing? I I don't I think it's I think it was like a conversation with one of my friends um I think it was probably Paul who still lives in that area and I think one day in like the group chat or when we were met up with him he probably just mentioned it in passing and I don't think it was that significant at the time uh because it was you know we've we've gone through this period of time with so many kind of beloved um LGBTQ plus venues closing down that I probably kind of raised an eyebrow and thought, yeah, probably that sounds about right at this point now and didn't think anything more of it. And I think it's with over the passage of time when you reminisce and I've been thinking a lot about Bristol recently, that's when you start to pull back all the memories that you had and realize kind of how significant a, a, a place it was um, and I think there's no, it was a, it was a, it was a bill. It was a very unique building. It was a real moment in time. There's no way you can re- replicate that. Did you ever go to Flamingos? Well, if you did, I would love to hear from you. Tell me your stories and share any photos that you might have from that time. You can find me across all social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, with the user handle K Anderson Music. You can also find out more about Will by following him on Twitter at Will WPW and also give the Track by Track podcast a follow on Twitter. The handle is at Track by Track UK and make sure you listen to a few episodes. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there and will be releasing songs over the next year. You can hear the first single, Well Groom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now on all good streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told someone who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. <laughs>